This episode of Nocturne is brought to you with the support of Audible. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 180,000 downloadable titles, including works of fiction and nonfiction. Audible is offering a free 30-day trial for listeners of Nocturne. Just go to audible.com slash nocturne, download a book, and start listening. One title you might consider is The Turn of the Screw. Oscar winner Emma Thompson narrates this gothic ghost story by Henry James, in which a governess comes to care for two isolated siblings who may be under the influence of malevolent spirits. You can support Nocturne by donating as little as $1 a month on Patreon, or on a one-time basis through PayPal. Any way you do it brings a huge smile to our faces as we work tirelessly to bring you a new episode of Nocturne every month. Go to nocturnepodcast.org and hit the donate button at the top of the page. Hey, this is Vanessa. I need to give you a cautionary heads up that this episode touches on things that could be triggering for some people. So please consider that when listening. And if you have kids with you, I would turn this off now. Also, I've heard from a lot of you that you enjoy listening to Nocturne before you fall asleep. I would not recommend that in this case. You're listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Sometimes the world of our dreams can be unsettling, even terrifying. The fear can be like an echo or a shadow of true emotion, or it can be utterly real, even justified. At times, the fearful experiences we have at night can introduce questions into the nature of reality itself. Many explanations have been offered for some of the most terrifying intrusions into sleep. Visitations from demons or aliens, hidden memories surfacing, neurological abnormalities. But questions are not always answered. Phenomena are left unexplained. There is no resolution. Night is not just day minus the light. It's like this whole different world, this whole different space. When the sun would go down, I would just drop down into this place, and I felt like um, I felt like a kid. I just felt like a terrified child. When J.D. was 24, he had moved to a new city to be near his college girlfriend. Within a month, she broke up with him. Not long after, his roommate moved out to get married. I was just devastated, and I didn't have a job. I was in a city I didn't know anybody, and I just had this, this huge relationship breakup. So definitely depression was kind of a piece of this puzzle. It felt like this descent, you know, into this deeper part of me. I was living alone for the first time in my life, and all of a sudden, this stuff started happening. J.D. uses the term, this stuff, as a container or placeholder for what he experienced. And what he experienced falls into the category of the worst things that you can imagine. The first thing that I remember is just this feeling that when the sun went down and it was night, I remember just not feeling safe. And I started to notice that this ritual was was developing Like, before I went to bed, I was constantly checking the locks on the doors. The blinds in my room had to be all the way down to the bottom. The blind had to be resting on the windowsill. It wasn't about someone outside looking in. It was just more this feeling of not being safe. The main ritual was about how my bed had to be when I was sleeping. Um, I'd slept with my head covered all my life, and I still do. But now I had to have all these blankets on top of me. And I remember that being a really hot summer. And I had to be covered in two or three blankets to feel safe. At one point, I nailed all these blankets up over my windows. I was, I was just trying to find a safe place, and I couldn't, I couldn't find it. As 
soon after all that ritual stuff started happening and living alone, I had this really vivid dream where I woke up in my house and my house was dark. I say house, I mean my apartment at the time. I was trying to get out of bed and I couldn't move and I was moving just super slowly. And I was trying to make my way across the room. And, and when I got out of my bedroom into the, like the dining room area, um, I could hear this voice. I could hear that someone was sitting on the couch in the dark. And I finally made my way in there and I see uh, my dad is sitting on the couch. But I know that it's not my dad. I know that it's this evil thing disguised as my dad. And he's, he's just saying this long string of words that don't make any sense. Just, just speaking these, this nonsense, uh, big long sentence with no breaks. And I was terrified. And it was like that lucid dream feeling of knowing that I was dreaming, um, but that I couldn't wake up. And I confronted him and said, you need to leave. And uh, he just, he laughed it off. I remember that feeling like a real starting point to this, to this thing. After that dream, a sort of pattern began to take form. Three things started to emerge. Things that happened when I was awake, things that happened when I was asleep, and things that happened in that space between waking and sleeping. When I was awake, I would feel this thing coming on, and I couldn't stop it, but I would kind of just tune out. I feel like my eyes would blur, and I felt like my mind would click off, and I would just kind of go, go to this different place. My arms were pulled behind my back. They were tied there with one ankle tied. I couldn't stop moving. Felt like someone was throwing me around. Like something was being shoved in my mouth. My hips would often move. He got me down on the ground and he laid on top of me. Feeling fingers, feeling like pencil sometimes one just time. Sometimes huge things. The, the pain of it, the agony I heard him it. take off his belt. It was the sound of a man taking there off his belt. There was this feeling of being raped. Great. Right. Feeling of rape. Soon after that, he was raped. I remember the first time it happened, I, I had a friend over, and I was just laying on the bed being thrown around. I felt like someone was throwing me around. There was this abusive aspect to it. My friend Dorothy was there, and she was trying to stop it. She was trying to, to hold me down and to say, you're okay. Obviously, she didn't, she didn't know what was going on, and I didn't know what was going on. But that's the first time I remember it happening. And then after that, it just seemed to happen more and more and more and more often. I never had any sort of visuals, although sometimes when I would close my eyes, I would kind of see these lightning flashes. The parts where I was awake, it was pure body. It was pure physical. It was nothing else. When this was starting and I was seeing that this was something that was happening in my life and I didn't know what it was, when I would feel it coming on, I would need to get to a safe place so that I could let it happen. Sometimes I could postpone it but I could never just stop it. These would last um, anywhere from five to 10 minutes to hours. At first, it felt like every night or almost every night. And uh, when it was over, th the feelings left there um, kind of differed. Sometimes I felt just this deep shame Sometimes I would cry. Sometimes I would just be exhausted. I would feel like my body, I, I felt like I'd just run a marathon. And other times there was this sense of profound relief, like I'd gotten rid of something. There were a number of triggers that would trigger this thing. Uh, being really tired, sometimes it would, it would start. Sex was one. It essentially made romantic physical relationships pretty much impossible. So that's pretty much the awake stuff. Um, and that really didn't change throughout like that 10 year period. This is the asleep stuff. Like when I was actually sleeping that just didn't feel like normal dreams or even normal nightmares. One of the recurring things was dreams of physically fighting my dad that 
all of a sudden we would just we would be fist fighting you know like like trying to hurt each other trying to kill each other i remember there was one where we were fighting and he got me down on the ground and then he laid on top of me and it just it felt it felt sexual i have no memory whatsoever of ever being sexually abused but i know exactly how it feels <laughs> And sometimes in dreams, I felt like the people that were there weren't just, it wasn't just normal stuff where I wake up and I feel like, wow, that was, that was a dream, but it's over now. Sometimes it felt like these visitations where it was someone that looked like a human, but it wasn't. I remember this one woman that came one time. I had woken up and fallen back asleep and this woman was in my room and she just had this horrible face and she was grabbing me and throwing me around and she held me up to the mirror and I was just this this crying little baby, this little infant baby. And when I would wake up, whatever I was looking at would have this face in it. And the face was always looking at me, it was always smiling and it was moving its mouth like my dad in that dream, just, just one solid string of words. It was just moving its mouth like really fast, just saying all these words. And I, I could never hear it, but I would, I would always see it. There's the awake stuff, there's the asleep stuff, and then there's that space between being asleep and being awake. That state, that, that sense of being conscious, like you know you're in bed, but I can't open my eyes, I can't wake up. And then, and then things start to happen. I would say that the things that happened through that time have probably been the, the most frightened I've ever been in my life. Um, sometimes my heart was beating so fast I thought I was gonna have a heart attack and die. The time that this happened most often was early morning, like sun was coming up, it's like, like between five and six in the morning, like I would have already woken up earlier and now I was falling back asleep and often I would fall asleep on my back and then I'm lying in bed I can't move and any number of things could happen many times there were noises really loud noises like loud pops or cracks like like lightning in my head uh, a lot of times there were voices and it it does not feel like a dream. It feels like, I know I'm in bed, I know I'm, I'm awake, and there's someone in the room. There's this real primal fear that comes as a result of being helpless, of, of lying there. The term is uh, sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is a well-documented sleep disorder, occurring during the transition between sleep and wakefulness. There can be powerful hallucinations and physical sensations, it's common to perceive an intruder in the room. And as its name implies, people feel completely paralyzed, which can make the experience even more terrifying. The one that I really remember, and this is, I call this the incident, because I don't know if anything can sum all this up in one incident, but for me, for some reason, this one does. I'm, I'm lying in bed, I'm in that same room, that, that place that I lived alone. It's a sunny morning after being awake, I fell back asleep. I'm on my back. And this Frank Sinatra song comes on. And what I believed at the time is, oh my God, someone upstairs is listening to this and I can hear it. But it was so clear. I don't remember any of the words, but I, when I got up and wrote it down, I remember that the concept that he was singing about was being selfish in silence. That he was saying there are certain times in my life where I like to be alone by myself and be selfish in silence. I have tried to find that song. I don't think it exists. I think the music stopped. And then I realized that I was in my room and that someone was standing in the doorway. So I'm trying to wake up and I can hear him walking across the room towards me. And I can feel him standing over the bed. And that moment, I can pretty much safely say that's the most, that's the most frightened I've ever been. Um, I knew that someone was in my room and they were standing over the bed 
and I couldn't move, and I couldn't wake up. That's the one that just, that just sums up this whole thing. Just the utter powerlessness of, of not being able to move and not being able to control any of these things that are happening to me. The other thing um, that I remember hearing is a child crying and, um, and this one time I remember this young child, I'm assuming it's a boy but I don't know, screaming, Daddy, no, really loud. And so, I don't know how to say this. I was starting to form um, a belief about what happened. And I, I felt like I was putting these pieces together, trying to solve this mystery. And things were pointing to the fact that I had been abused sexually somehow by my father. I love my parents, and I've grown to, to realize that they're both really, really good people. And I kind of just stopped talking with them when this stuff started happening, and I didn't hear from them. Three years went by in which they didn't speak. I sent my dad a letter, the letter. Um, in the letter, I was, I was very careful not to accuse him of anything. But I, I admit it was it was still angry. It still had that anger underneath it. And basically what I said in the letter is, here's what's been going on with me. And here's what I'm afraid might have happened. So I, I didn't accuse him of anything. I didn't say you did this. I didn't even say, uh, I think you did this. It just, it said these things are happening. And this is, this is, I'm afraid this is what happened. What I said in the letter is it's going to take more than you denying it to make me, you know, believe otherwise. So I sent the letter, and I heard back from him. It was probably a month later, and it was very angry, and to me it sounded very defensive. Six or seven more years passed with no contact, and in that time, something shifted. J.D. no longer felt the same sense of conviction. I can't tell you how that happened. Um, I, I can tell you this. I told myself that I would not forgive my dad. I would not let this thing go until I knew exactly what happened to me. And I realized at some point that that was, that was a loop. That, that there was potential for never communicating with my father again because I don't get this information. And so it was important for me at some point in this long process to say, even if I don't know what happened, even if I never know why all this stuff happened, um, I'm going to be willing to let this stuff go. And that's kind of when the process of coming back together with them started. I don't say I know things in my heart because the heart is not a place where you know things. The heart is where you believe things. That's what I believe. So I started to say I know in my heart that my dad didn't sexually abuse me, but I don't know that in my heart. Um, I believe that in my heart, and everything that I know now backs that up. I asked J.D. if he had let go of the thought that he'd been abused. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, I want to be really clear. I'm not clear that I wasn't sexually abused. Unless someone comes forward, you know, and says, here's what I did to you, or someone else has information that they give me, there's no way I can know that. I'm, I'm clear that I wasn't sexually abused by my father. My dad and I have had enough talks, and I, f I feel like I'm intuitive enough that if there was something there, that I would know. The fallout continues, though, from that period in J.D.'s life and the questions that were raised. My dad is, if he doesn't have Alzheimer's or dementia already, I feel like it's coming, and it's, it's pretty bad. He found that letter in a file a few weeks ago, and he didn't remember that this had gotten resolved between us, and it was horrible. 
it was my mom sent me an email and said, you have to call your dad. But when I called and talked to him, he wouldn't even talk to me. He didn't remember that we had talked about this, we'd resolved it, we'd had 15 years of having a good relationship again. And he was just, he was devastated. It was being on the phone with him for 30 to 40 minutes, gently reminding him and convincing him that we had solved this between us. The worst part about this for me, all of this stuff, is that I stopped talking with my dad. I cut off communication with my parents for, it was almost exactly a decade. And um, I still feel guilty about that. The guilt lives alongside relief. The terrors of J.D.'s nights have left him. I would say it's 99% gone. Like the feeling of being in, in half-awake, half-sleep, that feeling of being paralyzed and not being able to move and being, and being scared in that place, those episodes still happen. Happens much less. I know not to sleep on my back, especially in the early morning. I, I've, I've learned that. But it doesn't happen uh, nearly as much as it used to. And definitely the sexual, the sexually violent part of it, I'm afraid to say it's 100% disappeared. Um, I, I have, I'm nervous about saying that. But it's essentially 100% disappeared. I haven't felt that in a number of years. J.D. doesn't know why most of these terrifying episodes just stopped. I think the hard part about this is that there was never any sort of resolve, you know? Um, It just, it faded away, and then my life was just different. And I felt like I'd moved on from it. I didn't feel like I was putting something in a box that hadn't been dealt with. I felt like I dealt with it every single day the best that I could. And then it wasn't happening anymore, so I just kind of moved on in my life. J.D. has done some research recently and found that he's not alone in a lot of the things he endured during those 10 years. All this time, I just just believed I was alone going through this, that, that nobody had gone through anything like this before. But apparently, other people have gone through similar things. To know that other people can't sleep on their back because they'll be laying in bed paralyzed believing someone else to be in the room, to know that somebody else has had that experience and that it's a medical condition as opposed to like an emotional one, that was really helpful for me to learn. It just puts one of these big puzzle pieces, I'll say into perspective, I I feel like that question has been answered. The things that happened while he was awake are harder to make sense of. You know, what about the awake stuff? That particular piece, to me, doesn't answer that question. So as far as the the sexual abuse part of it, I made a list on on paper one time. This was after it had kind of just faded away. Like, is this memories of, of things that happened in my life? And if so, who? Is this past life stuff? Was this ghost stuff? Was that like people who had been alive? Was it demonic stuff? Was it like this evil stuff? Was it like aliens? Like extraterrestrial? Or was I just fucking crazy? And right now, I feel at peace with not knowing. I feel like my relationship with the night is different now. I feel like the two of us have made peace with one another. I see night as, as like this beautiful thing now, and I actually enjoy going to sleep at night. I have kind of my own rituals that aren't fear-based, that just feel really good, and I, I really enjoy turning out the light and you know, my eyes closing and falling asleep. And that was not an enjoyable experience for so long. So questions remain. 
what propelled JD into his nighttime world of fear? And even more, what caused it to end? How do you make sense of something like this? We as adult humans often want to feel like we're in charge of our destiny, where we're headed in our past. And so much of, so much of my life has been just simply how things unfold. And so, you know, it would be great to say, well, I can, I can point to this moment. And at that moment, everything changed. And as a result of that moment or that series of happenings, I can now say that I, I feel at peace with this thing where I didn't before. But <laughs> my life really hasn't operated that way. I usually look back and go, you know, I don't know how the fuck I got here <laughs> or what I did to get here, but here I am and it's working now. And so to ask the question, how have I gotten to the place where I am now without some sort of conscious resolve? I, I don't know. Sometimes things work out that way. We can only guess at what pivotal piece shifted to change the whole picture. We're all comforted by explanations, but we don't always get answers. And even when we do, reality can have a way of shifting. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Nocturne is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Huge thanks to JD for bravely sharing his story. If you experience sleep paralysis and night terrors, this is a real thing. You are not alone, and there is help. You can find links to information about sleep disorders at nocturnepodcast.org in the notes for this episode. Thanks to Audible for supporting the show. Go to audible.com slash nocturne for a free 30-day trial. You can find information about the music in this episode at nocturnepodcast.org. Artwork is by Robin Galante. Web design by Eric Peterson. Thanks to Rob McGinley-Myers for editorial help. Nocturne is part of The Herd, a collective of well-crafted and thought-inspiring audio shows. One of those shows is Neighbors by Jacob Lewis. Here's a clip from The Tuba Man. The trolls were bitching about the garbage, the anger. Our environment is full of uh, upset people stuck in a big traffic jam who have no respect for the tunnel, and they're putting a bad vibe on it. The thicket elves or whatever, they, they go, man... We got a guy here who could uh, do something for that. Man, he cleaned up our thicket. It's a beautiful, wonderful place. You know, y'all come down, y'all enjoy it too. He plays tuba all the time in the house. We could probably reach him in a dream and get him to go play in the tunnel. Find out more about Neighbors and all the other shows in The Herd at theherdradio.com. That's H-E-A-R-D. Thanks for listening.